The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. That's my king. Good morning. Oh, I heard you. All right. I like Sam, man. He's got so much energy. I told him before I got up here, I said, man, I, I like that prayer of yours. I said, man, you got so much energy, you can tell immediately that you deal with young people. Right? I, I like him. What a great guy. You know, I have the privilege of preaching today, and I, I want to thank the church for giving me that opportunity. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, the first worship was great. This one was even better. I mean, this was great. I did, this is the first time I think I've actually sat through two services, right? So this, this is amazing. What, a, what an opportunity. What a, what a blessing to be able to meet twice, twice. So if this is your first time today, well, uh, what a blessing it's been. Last week, Brother Joel, uh, he did a message called Change. He talked about our identity in Christ, and, and he made a distinction between who we are and our identity in Christ, all right? And, and in that, he talked about the transformation that is going on, that's taking place in each of our lives. If you've committed your life to Christ, then there's a change taking place. And so our actions reflect our thoughts, right? So the change of thought now is going to be reflected in the change of actions that takes place. Let me read something to you that uh, I think will kind of connect what I'm going to be doing today with what Pastor Joel was doing last week. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we are simultaneously living in two kingdoms. One temporary, the other eternal. We operate within two cultures. One dictated by the desires of men, the other by the desires of God. One is upside down, the other is right side up. And so we've entitled this message, Upside Down. You see, we've grown up in a physical world, a temporary kingdom in which, well, it's passing away. But we're conditioned to think a certain way, to react a certain way, to to maybe think that certain things have value that perhaps God doesn't necessarily put as much value in it. And so there's an upside-down quality to this present life. And that's in relationship to this kingdom that God has designed, a godly kingdom, an eternal kingdom that's right-side-up, right? You can't have an upside-down if you don't have a right-side-up, right? Right? So God's kingdom is the right side up. So conditioning us to think in that way, well, that, uh, that puts God in a situation where he's got a pretty tough job on his hands. I, I know he does with me. I don't know about you. But conditioning me and trying to get me to think right so that I'll act right, he's got a, 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 he's got a job on his hands there. Well, last week in the message... We talked about that change. Now we talk about the motive, the motive behind it. See, we want to change. God wants us to change, but, but sometimes we're doing a good thing, right? And we say, well, that's enough, right? 
I'm doing a good thing. Yeah, but are you doing it for the right reason? Have you ever thought about it like that? I know it's happened to me. I've done some good things. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good thing, right? And God says, why'd you do it? I said, let's not talk about that. <laughs> hey, let's, let's have that conversation some other time, right? You, you see, you say, well, is, is God kind of being a little perfectionist there? Yeah, he is. You see, he, he's got a bigger plan for me. He, he's, got, he's got a different idea than what I do. And I think, well, I'm just going to do a good thing. And he says, no, I want you to do it for the right reason. Now, it's not that he's not giving me credit for the doing the good thing. He just wants it to be perfect, right? He just wants it to be right. So, in our, in our lesson today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 20, but... Before I, I read that, before I get to that, I want to give you a little background on it. You see, Matthew 19 kind of introduces what Jesus is going to tell us in Matthew chapter 20. In fact, I didn't tell this to the first group, but in Matthew chapter 20, Matthew gives us a parable that none of the other Gospels gives us. And not only that, but Jesus doesn't really tell us all the ins and outs of what it means. We kind of have to figure that out ourselves. And so the, the thing that kind of stuck out in my mind in chapter 19 of Matthew was this. Peter has a question for Jesus. And you'd have to read Matthew 19, the whole thing, really, to get the gist of this. I don't want to go through all of that because we don't have enough time to do that. But here's what it is. Peter's question is this. We've forsaken all and followed you. What will we get? What will we get? Now, let, let's put that in context. Have you ever done something and asked the question, what's in it for me? What am I going to get? Right? It's normal thinking. All right? That's the way we think in a world that we live in. Right? But the question is, is that the way God thinks? Is that the way God's thinking? When you do something, is he, is he thinking, okay, I'm going to give you something for it? And what is that something if he does give it to us? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, I'm going to read verses 1 through 16. I just call this the parable. I real, real uh, easy outline here, the parable. In verse number 1, he says this, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. That's that was the normal day's wage for a day's work. And by the way, if you're complaining about working eight hours a day, they're working 12 hours a day. So thank, thank your employer that he's not making you work 12 hours, okay? Anyway, so verse number three. And about nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. Now, I don't, want to, I don't want to leave that yet. What does he mean by I'll pay you what is right? Have you ever talked to your employer and, and, and him say this? Hey, I'd like you to do a job for me, but I'll, I'll pay you what is right. Yeah, I like that agreement, right? Do you really trust him that much to do that? Think about what's going on here. The first group... Here's what happens. He goes out, he hires them for an agreed wage. Okay, I like that, right? But the second group, and this, there's a few of them, right? It's all with the same idea. I will pay you what is right. Ooh, look at the trust element there, right? Trust me to pay you what is right. All right, so here we go. I don't know if I read it again, but verse number five. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked him, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. That's a whole day's wage. 
So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. Then they received it. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour. They said, and you have made them equal to us who have, been, have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who has hired, was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. That saying is the last saying in Matthew chapter 19. That same saying. Now, what does he mean by the parable? He doesn't tell us, right? But somehow or another, it's related to this last being first and first being last, right? I don't know about you, but when you read it, maybe you came to the same conclusion I came to. Seems unfair. Doesn't it? Seems a little unfair. You work a whole day, you get a whole day's wage, right? Some clown comes in, works an hour, and gets a whole day's wage. I don't think so. <laughs> in this world, it don't happen like that. It's not supposed to happen like that, right? Here's our problem with this. <laughs> We're thinking in terms of money, right? We're thinking in terms of profit. So let's, let's kind of reevaluate this. I'm going to give you what I think this means. And there's two possibilities here that I've come up with. Number one, when God took Abraham and developed the nation of Israel from him, right? He called them out. He made a covenant with them. You know what that is, right? It's an agreement. It's an agreement, okay? You do this, I do this. Well, we know that that didn't necessarily work out so great, but God was faithful to his promise. He was faithful to his promise. That was the first. So let's kind of look at it like this. The Old Testament is kind of like the first. There was an agreement, and God was faithful in that agreement. But who's the last? Who's the last? That's you and me. That's you and me. We're the last. You see, Peter's question, what are we going to get? Well, you're going to get the inheritance, Peter. The inheritance. There's only one inheritance. God promised it to Israel, but he also promised it to somebody else, and that was you and I. He promised the inheritance to us. So you see, the last, well, it becomes the first, and the first becomes the last. We can look at it in a chronological order that way. It, the, the parable kind of indicates that. But it also is kind of a slap in the face to their religious society that was thinking about the inheritance in a way that God wasn't thinking about it. But you and I have a little bit more of a grasp on that than what they did. The first becomes the last, the last becomes the first. But there's another idea here, one I want to leave you with. If you get an inheritance, how much of the inheritance do you get? All of it. Right. All of it. So what part of the inheritance do we not get? We get it all. Regardless of whether you work 12 hours a day or whether you work one hour a day. You get it all. Okay, that's not fair, right? Oh, but that's to our favor. We'll take that one. We'll take that one. You see, that's, that's really kind of what's going on here. Jesus isn't really talking about money. It's kind of like, let's just put that idea of money and substitute it with blessing. Okay? Blessing. How much of a blessing do you need today? As much as I can get. Okay, you know what? God has as much as you can get today. You say, what about tomorrow? Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's not here. 
and your blessing for tomorrow, you don't need it yet. And you know what? God has unlimited resources because he's given you and I the inheritance and he gives it to us as we need it. There's another possible explanation there, okay? In other words, it's like this. God owns it, God gives it to whom he chooses to give it when he chooses to do so and be thankful for it. That's the best I can come up with, okay? All right. Moving along, point number two. Point number two. What we do now is, is we have this parable and now we have the prophecy because Jesus is now going to tell them something he already told them in Matthew chapter 16. We're going to hear it again. Verse number 17 of chapter 20. He says this, Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Oh, by the way, chief priests and teachers of the law. Who were they in that society at that time? That's the big guys. That's the first guy. That's the first. That's the number one people. The people that call the shots, right? That's the people that are supposed to know, who think they know. Well, here's another one. Let's go on with this. They will condemn him to death. Really? They're going to condemn the Messiah to death? Why are they doing that? Because they don't have a clue as to what's going on, do they? Right? They don't have a clue. And here's another thing. They don't like the program. And so they're saying, in essence, get rid of him so we can have it our way. It's our agenda. It's our agenda. Okay? Brother Joel brought that up last week. Verse 19, and we'll hand him over to the Gentiles. Oh, it looks like... You know what? The Jews thought the Gentiles were trash, but they needed the Gentiles at this particular time to fulfill their agenda. Okay? He will be mocked and flogged and crucified, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. You know what that is? That's the last becoming the first. You'll get it. It's the last becoming the first. Do you know how he died as a what? A criminal. You know what criminals are in our world? They're the last. Now that doesn't mean as a human being they have no value, but in our society we kind of look at them as the last, right? Jesus is looked at as the last in his society. But let me read you a passage of scripture here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. I'm just going to read it. It's not going to be up on the screen. Here's what it says. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whoa, the last becomes the first. You say, well, he started out as the first. He did, but he sacrificed the first to be the last so you and I could be first. I think we're on the same page. Huh? <laughs> Point number three. Point number three. We go from a parable, a prophecy, and then we have the petition. The petition. <laughs> And this one is amazing, all right? You know, the older I get, the more I realize how many mistakes I really make, all right? In fact, I have these notes meticulously written, typed out, 
in bold fonts and every, anything that I can have because if I get up here and I try to do this, I'm going to forget an important word and I'm going to be lost, right? Mistakes, little inaccuracies, little things like that. Well, listen to this one. Verse number 20 of chapter 20, beginning with 20, going to 23. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You get what she's doing there? Now listen, it's okay, mothers, that you love your kids. It's okay, all right? But stop trying to put them in the top position on the sly. Okay, you see, what they're, you see what she's doing? I love my kids, and I want them to have the number one and the number two spot under you, Jesus, in your kingdom. Okay, I think you guys have missed the point here. You've missed the point. You see, and Jesus is going to be really kind here. He's not going to rebuke them. Okay, but here's what he says. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Guys, I get it. But you know what? I can't give you that. I can't give it to you. I'm going to kind of put this in parentheses. It's not really right for you to ask for that. Okay? You need to be content and satisfied with what you get and stop trying to get what you don't have. Okay? It's tempting to desire the top positions. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with working your way up. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with achieving something. But once again, why do we want it? Why do we want it? You want a good, good person to study? Watch Chariots of Fire someday, the story of Eric Little. A man who had tremendous talent who said this in essence, I'm summarizing it. God's first, everything else is second. Okay, just a thing. So here's what it is. This petition, it seems like it's so out of place. Right? Because Jesus is teaching what? First shall become last, and last shall be first. And here what they're asking for is what? I want to be first. Uh, wrong question. Wrong question. Point number four. This is the principle. This is where Jesus is really going to get into what he's talking about here. And this is where it challenges you and I. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 24 to 28, Here's what he says. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Well, obviously, right? They wanted that position, right? Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Let me restate that, okay? Whoever wants to be first must be last. Must be last. I don't like being last, right? You're not going to be first if you're not willing to be last. Oh, maybe in this world, but not in the kingdom of God. Right? Not in the kingdom of God. He says here, verse 27, And whosoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many you realize what Jesus did for us? Took upon himself 
flesh and bone. I, I like the way Michael Card says it. Infinity stepped into time. Do you realize what that must have been like? For eternity to step into time, the limitations of time, to put up with the abuses of man's sin upon himself, to take our ambitions, to take our desires, our sin, and all of the things, and place it upon himself on the cross. For nothing else than to bring us into his family. I, I was tempted when I came up here to say, my name is Ron Croft. And you might say, well, what's your position? My position is I'm a child of God. What position do I need, right? You see what I'm saying? And the only reason I could say that is because Jesus became a servant so that I could have an inheritance with him. I'll take it. No questions asked. I'll take it. We all have a desire to be somebody. We really do. Maybe it's not a huge desire, but it's there. The disciples were no different. They wanted to be top, number one. They didn't understand. And this is our final thought. This is the final thought. They didn't understand this principle. True greatness is found in humbly serving others. Test it out. Test it out. You can, you can claw and, and scream and do whatever you want to get to the top position, but I'm going to tell you something. You'll have more influence with people and you'll have a greater ministry on your hands if you just serve people. Right? You remember Jesus said this, in giving somebody a cup of water in my name, you do it unto me, right? So whatever it is that you're doing in 2021, look for the opportunities to serve because in serving, you become great in the kingdom of God. There's no other way to the top. Thank you very much.